Well, we're going to pick it up in uh, Genesis 33 this morning, and we're continuing our study in uh, Genesis, God and Man. And the title of this morning's message is Esau was coming. Esau was coming. I know what you're feeling when me, mom, pop up were coming. We had a countdown and we were looking forward to it. Um, but today we're going to see that Jacob wasn't looking forward to Esau coming. And as we've talked about throughout Genesis, God and man, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And today we're going to get a little tiny picture of Esau as well. But Jacob obviously wasn't excited for Esau to be coming up the road to meet him. Uh, if you don't remember, we'll look over that Esau and Jacob were born. They were twins. They were fighting in their mother's womb back and forth over and over. Uh, if you remember uh, that when uh, Jacob was born, he came out grabbing on his brother's heel. And that's where he gets his name from, heel catcher, deceiver. But Esau and Jacob, although they were twins, they were different. Esau was that outdoorsman, always out hunting. He was hairy. That's what his name means. Uh, but Jacob was more around the house. He was a chef. And both of them were men. Both of them were boys. Uh, there was not one that was better than the other. They were just different. Uh, however, uh, Isaac favored uh, Esau and Rebekah favored Jacob, if we remember. Uh, so they had a, quite a rivalry as children. Uh, remember, when they were a little bit older, uh, Jacob sold a bowl of stew to his brother Esau for Esau's birthright. Esau had come in from the field. He was hungry. He's like, I'm so hungry. Where's that stew? And Jacob, being the little conniving guy, was like, well... Give me that birthright. And Esau didn't quite care about it then. And then we remember when I, uh, Isaac thinks he's going to die, and he doesn't even die for at least 20-something years after that, even more. Um, he ends up blessing Jacob by mistake. They deceived him. Jacob's mom told him to put, make some stew, put some goat skin on his arms, go in there, wear some of Esau's stinky gym clothes, and trick his dad. And what happened then, Esau cared about his birthright. And Esau wanted to kill Jacob. So much so that his mom told him to leave and go to his uncle Laban's house. And I think she thought it would blow over. Esau's got a hot temper. It'll be done. He'll come back next week. But it wasn't safe to come back. Esau wanted truly to kill his brother there. That these twins who were together in the womb, although fighting from birth, their fighting had reached a pinnacle, a culmination, whatever you want to call it, to where one was willing to kill the other and they were separated. <coughs> But now, at God's leading, Jacob is on the way back home. We remember that Laban had pursued him, and they had set up that pillar, and they decided to go their separate ways. Uh, but this morning, I think we're going to look at a lot of things that deal with trust. I feel like that is the main tenet to take away from this, is about trusting. And trust is apparently, as someone else defined it, someone who had a publishing company, and they're trusted as the, the person to make the definition, says... It's the firm belief in reliability, in truth, in ability or strength of someone or something. An archaic version of the word was used for a hope or an expectation. And I think that that's interesting how that kind of carries through into trust. You know, we, when we trust someone, we have a hope that they're going to give us good advice or that they're going to take care of us. We expect them to. There's hope and there's expectation involved in that. Uh, sort of a... Uh, it's almost like love in a way where you marry, you marry someone because you love them and you trust them. Well, hopefully you trust them or you want to trust them or you lie to yourself and tell them to trust them. But it's to have faith or confidence in something. You know, as the old saying goes, you trusted that chair this morning without even thinking. I trusted the lights would turn on. I trusted the air would turn on. I trusted my brakes would work. Um, when I was flushing uh, Ashley's brakes a while ago, I had to replace the master cylinder and all these other things, couldn't get all the air out. I didn't really trust the brakes until I knew that they were, they were good and had tested them for some time. And when they were tested and they worked and I even got someone else's opinion on them, I knew that it was safe to go and that I, I had fixed it. But it just didn't feel the way I expected it to. Man, sometimes in life it's hard to know who to trust, right? All these politicians at election time, they all want you to trust them enough to put them in charge of the free world. And the world tends to work on a system of earning trust. I think some of that is good. I think some of it is overbearing, but some of it's good. You hire someone, you want to make sure that they can do the job. You might, what we do is we hire someone, tempt to hire, where they work for us for a few months, where they see if they like the job, and we see if we like them, and if they can indeed do what they say they can do. 
Uh, and then when we see that, then you trust them. And then even at some point, you might even get promoted when they see that you are trustworthy. But a lot of times in the world, when you break that trust, you have to work to regain it, right? And I think in some sense that that is valid because trust is something that in some sense needs to be earned. You don't want to just put your trust in something that you haven't tested or tried. But I think a lot of times in the world, forgiveness isn't in the equation. That man, you have to keep earning yourself until I trust you to be my friend again, or I trust you to work for me again. And how often do I remember having trips put on me or putting trips on my friends? Well, you did this to me, so you gotta do this and this, and finally, now I won't hold it over your head anymore. Now I forgive you because you've worked it off, so to speak. And it's a way of works to erase a sin. But as believers, we shouldn't need to do that and it's necessary to trust someone again. When it comes to marriage, there needs to be forgiveness and trust. And yeah, maybe you might be a little nervous for a while. You might be praying for longer and you might know, but you, you need to forgive and move on. There's no amount of works is going to make up for it. We need to be careful that we're not putting a trip on someone to earn their forgiveness as opposed to build their trust back up. There's a difference there, but I think a lot of times we tie them together. You know, in the news, fake news, who do you believe? The left, the right, the east, the west, the north, the south, those in charge, those who want to be in charge. It's hard to say these days. I'm inclined to say, trust no one. <laughs> trust no one. It's sad though, even with online security, cybersecurity, your password is getting hacked, your uh, social security number getting out, someone else can pretend to be you, and you're left up a creek. All about trust. And it's easy to see how all this lack of trust in our society, all this lack of security, lack of telling the truth is really headed towards this end system where people are going to put their ultimate trust in a man and a system of a man and take a mark to say, look, you can trust me. I've got the mark. I'm for the system. I can buy and I can sell. But let's not go down that path this morning. I'll go there forever. But sometimes we trust just because we want to, even though we know we shouldn't. If you've ever been in a bad relationship and you know that they've cheated on you, you know that they've gone behind your back in business, you know that they talk about you all the time and that they're not really a friend, but you want them to be in your life for some reason. You care about them so much and you just keep trusting them even though you know you shouldn't, even though everyone in the world tells you, what are you doing? Sometimes our trust gets mixed in with other emotions and sometimes it's hard to be objective with who we can trust. But I read this last night even. It says, Micah 7, 2 through 7. It says, The faithful man is perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net, that they may successfully do evil with both hands. Think about that. That now in the world, you can go out and do evil with both hands, and you might even get a government grant to do so. Or in the old days, you kind of had to cover it up, had to keep one hand behind your back. In fact, that's where the handshake comes from, is showing as a knight that I don't have a sword in my hand. And the salute, putting up the mask to uncover your face. But if you were smart, you'd be a lefty soldier, <laughs> and you'd shake with your right hand and get him with the other one. In fact, that happens in the Bible in one place. But it says, the prince asks for gifts. The judge seeks a bribe. And a great man utters his evil desire. So they scheme together. The best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman and your punishment comes. Now shall be their perplexity. Verse 5 says, Do not trust in a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. For son dishonors father. Daughter rises against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. Therefore, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Micah talks about an evil time where you can't even trust those of your own household. And the boy, that time is fast approaching. But it sounds a lot like today. And I wonder, who do we trust? Who do we trust? Trust people that maybe we should? Trust people that maybe we shouldn't? Maybe there's other people that we should be putting our trust in. But truthfully, God is the only one we can trust. Everyone unfortunately in this life, will break your trust at some point. And truthfully, we will break everyone's trust at some point as well, too. Let's try not to. But sadly, it's usually a given. Second Samuel twenty two thirty one says, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. 
Psalm 9.10 says, And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. I love that. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who trust you. And other times, we don't trust people when really, we really should. I think this verse, I've read it before, but it goes real well with today. Proverbs 18.19 says, A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. I mean, it, the closer the person is, the more offended and easily they might even get offended, but the harder it is to win them back, that it's easier to go capture a whole city as a military person than to make amends with a brother whom you've offended. Trust is a hard thing. But we need to be willing to trust as believers. We need to trust in the Lord and from there let that flow down. Because when our expectations are set in the right way, we can trust people and not put too much trust in them. Not put too much faith in them because we put the bulk of our trust in the Lord to take care of our needs. So that way when someone doesn't come through for us, well, we go, okay, well, I know I'm not relying on you for my help. I'm relying on God for my help. And we're not going to be as quick uh, to break off the relationship. If they do, you know, obviously there's, if they do something completely wrong to us, we need to watch out. But sincerely, we're not going to be let down as much in life because God will never let us down. And God, this morning, we know that you won't ever let us down. You won't ever leave us or forsake us. And God, we, we ask that God, the place in our lives that we're not trusting you, help us to trust you. The places in our lives where we've misplaced our trust, help us to put that in the right place. And God, if there's people we need to trust again, help us to forgive them and trust them and be friends with them or whatever it is that, that relationship is. And there's people that uh, we shouldn't share deep things anymore, shouldn't trust them in things anymore uh, because they prove themselves faithful time and time again. God, let that be as well. But uh, if there's a way for uh, restoration to happen, that would be great as well. But God, we ask that you speak to us in your word. We trust it and we need to trust it more. So help us hear from you and give us a word this morning that we can trust in for what each of us are going through. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to go through this uh, chapter. It's not that long, so you might get through quicker than ever, but we'll see. Now let's read the first three verses together. It says, Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were 400 men. So Jacob divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. We see here that Jacob has been on his way, and he looks up this morning, and he sees, well, probably a big dust cloud. Probably seeing the distance quite some ways, and I don't think it's hard to see 400 men coming your way. Maybe in horses, maybe marching. They've got all sorts of things to go. There's probably a dust cloud, a clamor, and it's not easy to miss when there's probably just one mountain path that they're coming down, and you see this row of people coming after you. Um, I, I keep going to... Israel and when they're pursued by Pharaoh and just thinking of all these things being similar pictures of that and similar trials and things that go on. Obviously Esau, as we'll see, is not Pharaoh and his intentions are different, but I see these things in Israel's past that uh, repeat in their future. But can you imagine that? You're there with your family. You've come this long way. You've had all these buried feelings for your brother. Uh, all these suppressed memories that you probably wanted to forget about your childhood and about these things you did that were done to you, the strifes that you had in your home growing up, all these worries, and they all come rushing back to the surface. I'm sure he's been, it's kind of been on the back of his mind this whole time, maybe in the front of his mind, but now it's in front of him. Today is the day of reckoning for Jacob and Esau. Can you imagine that feeling? Do you feel the adrenaline that's pumping through his veins at this moment? Have you ever been in that situation where... You've had to deal with something, or you finally, this is the meeting you're going to have with that person. Oh, and now you got to go in and deal with it. Now, you know, your boss calls you in, or you've got to go deal with something else. Perhaps the panic. All right, maidservants, get your kids, go over there. Leah, take your kids, take, take Rachel's other kids. Rachel, you get the baby, you go over here. Like, he's coming, we don't have much time. I don't know if you've ever been in that sort of panic mode before, perhaps with a storm coming, having to run down to the basement or having to flee a hurricane or a tornado or something of that nature. But this is a tornado, a storm that Jacob can't avoid. It's one of perhaps uh, the hardest kind, the worst kind, one of uh, emotion and family. But God had told him to come back. 
I don't know if Jacob is remembering that at this moment. In this moment of panic, in this moment of confrontation, I don't see Jacob telling his family, remember, God called us here. Remember, this is what God has for us. I see him panicking. And not again that practical preparation and planning is impor- isn't important. It is important. And I think in some, some sense it is wise to do these things. He doesn't know what Esau's intents are. But he does know what God told him. God said, go back. I'm going to make you a great nation. You know, how can he make him a great nation if his family is killed? Um, you know, I'm not sure that Jacob trusts God's plan and God's word at this moment. I'm sure he does to some extent. He's come all the way with his whole family. Um, but when the rubber meets the road, I, I see a little bit of spinning his wheels here. And so Jacob splits everyone up. He's got his plan. He sent the delegations already out before him, the animals and the servants. But now he's got his family split up even as well. He split them up as well. And it's very clear who Jacob values the least to the most in his family. He might say he have, has no favorites. He might say he loves them all. But we know that Rachel's his favorite. We see the maidservants. Well, they're just the maidservants. And those kids, they go first. And then there's a gap. And then it's Leah and her children. And then there's a gap. And then it's Rachel and the youngest. I don't know how old Joseph is here, but just having a newborn now, I, I picture my wife and the newborn stay in the back. Stay in the back. Get as far back. You know, we don't <laughs> bring him out very many places. We don't get sick in the first two months. After that, we'll bring him wherever. But it starts to make a lot more sense when we see the family dynamic in Joseph's life and in a couple of chapters. When we see the way his brothers treat him and even the brothers, uh, you know, the way they band together, there's a little more sense. These brothers are older. Dad's putting us first. He's putting Joseph in the back. <laughs> you know? It's, it's what it is. But it does say that he does go in front of them. That there is some change in Jacob here to where he's now willing to lead. He's willing to be the protector for them. Yeah, he split them up and it's clear what the order is. He's put some space between them. He's relying on his own tactics here. This is his last uh, end of the fourth quarter play here. But instead of being the cowering and self-preserving Jacob, he's now governed by God and he's leading as Israel, but only to an extent. Hey, it's better than nothing. Uh, you know, he's not hiding in the back behind his, all his kids and family, using them as human shields. That's great. That's good. But I don't think he went far enough. And it's easy for me to be the Monday morning quarterback or Sunday morning quarterback here in this case and critique him. I'm sure if my life was in the scripture and someone else had to teach on it, I would just want to be dead right now. <laughs> Please, I don't want to ever hear a lesson ever taught from my life. It would be awful. It would be embarrassing. It would be shameful at times. And maybe there might be one little redeeming quality here and there. But he sends these bands of gifts. He split up his family behind him. And now when Esau gets there, he bows himself down seven times. Can you picture this? These brothers grew up together who were fighting. One, one wanted to murder the other. The other one just wanted to steal his blessing. The, the one who has the blessing is now bowing down before Esau. That wasn't quite what the scriptures had alluded to before. He's trying to show, I believe, perfect submission to his brother. Seven times, the number seven of completeness in the Bible. Uh, I think it, in some sense, maybe it's on his old ways. It's a little bit of flattery. It's a little bit of self-preservation there. A little bit of, I, I can't protect myself, please. I'm at your mercy. And a little bit, of, I think, also perhaps of denying the blessing that God has on him. He was blessed even though he was the last one to come out. That He's really the firstborn. And he's the one that Esau should technically be bowing down to. In fact, the commentary says uh, from David Guzik, it says it's so common to suffer some problem because we try to accomplish what we think to be God's will or to protect our interest in merely human energy and wisdom. God never needs us to sin to help him fulfill his plan for our life. How many times do we bow down? We warm ourselves at the wrong fire, even though we know that God is our provision. No, you don't need to do it this way. Just trust God and let him take care of it. Despite what the situation looks like. Despite who's come back in your life with 400 uh, war-aged men. Let's go on to verse 4. We're just going to read one verse because this verse definitely sticks out to me. as sort of uh, one of the most powerful verses in this chapter. It says, But Esau ran to meet him 
and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. It says, but Esau ran. And if we look back, I don't know if it was here, but at certain times in history, running uh, was undignified. If you were a man of wealth, you didn't run. Now wealthy people put on their running clothes and they run miles and they post how far they've run on, on Instagram or whatever. But it was undignified. Unless it was in battle. So Esau's running toward him. I don't think he's got his sword out here. I think if he had his sword out, you might be able to say Esau's coming to get him. Maybe Jacob and saw the sword in his hand. It was just a glint of the sun. I don't know. Uh, you know, if you can imagine two groups of soldiers like in the movies that come clashing together, running together. But Esau ran. And I think, and I, from what I see here, that Esau was running here because he loved his brother. This was his twin brother. His little brother by three seconds. He missed him. He loved him. He wanted that reconciliation. He's got 400 men with him, which is a little bit of a confusing sort of... Uh, what do you say? Not sign. Um, body. It's not body language, but it's in some sense like confusing body language. Someone comes to you and they want. They say, "Hey, I want to be friends with you," but they look all tough and mean and imposing. Um, but it is what it was. He wanted that reconciliation. Again, it still doesn't quite explain those four hundred men. And I have to wonder. Maybe was Esau afraid of Jacob at this point? And how had he heard that Jacob was coming? Who ran and told him? You know, the, it's interesting to think about. Maybe Esau still finds his, his strength in numbers. That being this tough outdoors guy, he's got to have all his tough guys around him, you know, to be confident enough to do this. You know, how often, uh, you know, you ask a, I remember as a kid going to McDonald's, and my mom would want me to go place my order or something. I'd be like, no, no, please go with me. Now a little kid kind of needs to have someone with them all the time. Sometimes we do too. Was it a rough neighborhood and Esau just didn't want to, you know, leave his car unlocked at night? So he had his men with him. But maybe like David's band of men, you know, this was just his crew and he didn't think about it. But it's 400 guys. It's a little interesting. We look at peace delegations, even in the modern world. There's armies. They bring the Secret Service. Some of you watch the videos of when a president or dignitary goes to another country. There's motorcycles and police cars and Secret Service. And then they have the big vans, which look like vans and they're tinted out, but you know that there's a machine gun inside there because they want to protect. They're there for peace. They're there to talk, but just in case, you know, we've got a little army with us. And maybe that's where Esau is at this point. But when Esau gets there, he sees that Jacob doesn't have all that with him. Jacob's just been sending gifts ahead and he's got his, you know, who's up behind you over there? I see some people hiding in the bushes. And all this time we've seen what God had been doing in Jacob's life. The transformation that's happened in him, the struggles he's had, the conflicts. But from here, I think it's evident also that God was at work in Esau's life. I think at the very least, whether Esau is a godly man or not at this point, he forgives his twin brother. It may not be obvious to Jacob. It may be a situation even if I was in, I might be a little worried and wondered what's going on there. But we don't see Esau as we continue on do anything to harm him. He's got kind words. We'll see later, he doesn't pursue him. That he shows up. And he embraced him. They fell down together and wept. These two brothers who have been separated for so long are hugging. They probably kissed each other's cheek. They're crying. They fall down. They're weeping. Oh, brother, wherefore art thou? And they're back together. They're back together. This is beautiful. This is powerful. This is the work of God. Restoring families. Restoring close relationships. People that were separated are now back together. Thinking about marriages and I remember being at different conferences and God would speak to people and you'd find out that after that that their marriage would come back together. Even at uh, Tony's funeral there were people there um, who had been separated. I guess they, I think they were his neighbors and through Tony's passing God did a work in their lives. But can you imagine all the heartbreak, the relief, the healing in that moment? You know, for that one moment, they're not thinking about the 400 men. For that one moment, they're not thinking about the 30, 40 years between them. They're not thinking about all that happened in childhood. They're just like, oh, my brother, my brother, my twin brother. That's what, should, that's what it should be. That's what forgiveness is. That's truly what the work of the Lord is. And if it stops short of there, 
There's a little more to go. Let's go on. Verse 5 says, And Esau lifted his eyes and saw the women and children. So obviously they hadn't got too far away by the time Esau showed up, or maybe they saw them hugging and kissing and started to come out from their hiding place. And he says, Who are these with you? So Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maidservants came near, and their children, and they bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. And afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. So picture this. They're all there, all coming together, slowly, one by one, bowing down before Esau. And then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? Like, Jacob, why did you send me all this stuff? Like, why did you send all these people ahead? And Jacob said to him, in verse 8, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, No, please, if I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present for my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face, as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. So he urged him, and he took it. We see how excited Esau is to see how God has blessed his brother. Who are these people? Who are they? Is that your son? Is that your wife? Is that your daughter? Can you imagine? I imagine it's always nice kind of meeting up with a friend after a long time and seeing what God's done. And Who's this and who's that? But imagine brothers. Imagine brothers that their families begin to be reconciled. But we see here that even with this, Jacob talks and behaves quite distantly with his brother. He calls him Lord. His family doesn't come up and give him a hug and shake his hand and say, this is your Uncle Esau. They bow down to him. I love my brother. I've gone to his house plenty of times. And, you know, he's very uh, uh, influential in certain spheres in the world. I never bow down to him. And he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and he acts, Jacob sort of acts like meeting a king, someone he's still afraid of. Here, here I am, Lord. Here, here's my family. You know, like, don't hurt us. But it's good that everyone draws near. He doesn't keep even the closest Rachel and Joseph away from his brother. He brings them all near. He lays it all out. So although he's scared and although he's acting a little funny, he brings it all there. And Esau says, um, why did you send all these gifts and people to me? Like, why, why are you trying to find favor with me, brother? I believe Esau forgave his brother for all that happened. But I think also he's forgetting that at one time he wanted to murder his brother. Maybe he's trying to bring it up. Maybe he just totally forgets. I remember getting in fights with friends growing up. And we'd fight, and then a week or two later, we'd be like, what were we fighting about again? I'm like, I don't remember. I don't remember. Like, all right, so we good? Yeah, we good. And we go on, like brothers. And maybe that's what's happening here. But I believe also that true reconciliation and trust sometimes requires parties not only just to make amends, but also to ask for forgiveness of the things that they've done and not just forget them willfully or not. Um, sometimes there can be a hidden division on the surface. But Jacob calls Esau Lord and Esau calls Jacob brother. There's a clear difference in the way they are approaching this meeting together. Esau is coming to meet his brother. I don't know, maybe he said that because his brother has been kissing his feet, bowing down to him. He's like, okay, brother, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know what inflection was in his voice there. But there's definitely a difference there. Esau is just coming to meet his brother, and Jacob is just trying not to get killed. But he says, I have enough. Oh, look, I don't need you to give me these gifts. I don't need you to make up for what you've done. God's blessed me too. I know you've got the birthright, but I've got all plenty of stuff. I've got 400 guys with me. We can go take whatever we want. I don't need your gifts. God has blessed me. I just want my brother back. I think Esau came all this way, not to capture a city, but to capture his brother and his heart, and not in a bad way. But they have this awkward exchange of like, no, 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 I've got enough here. No, no, take it. And you know, this whole bartering thing comes back. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where you try and give a gift, and then like, no, 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 you don't need to give it. And like, no, 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 just take it. And then by the end, it's like, oh, it's just awkward. Can we just, just take it at first, or I should have just kept it. But maybe Jacob feels a little guilty about the blessing in his life and he's trying to appease his brother with it. I think perhaps it's blinded him to the fact that his brother doesn't want it. He's so just trying to make up for what happened. He's so trying to, to make amends. He doesn't see that the amends have already been made. 
Now, don't we do that often in our lives? Like, let's just get over it. We don't need to keep bringing it up. We don't need to keep saying sorry. Let's just move forward and, and be brothers again. Especially in the household of God. Because fleshly plans are of no avail in spiritual circumstances. That, man, if spiritually things have been handled, there's nothing else you can do. There's nothing else you need to do. You don't need to give that. You don't need to do that. And that's the same way with the Lord. He's like, I don't need all these gifts from you. You don't need to make a sacrifice for me. Just be my brother. Come with me. Let's go do something together. Esau takes it, takes the gift, and he was urged to. He wasn't looking for a fight. In Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Now, Jacob is doing a good thing. He should, in some sense, be trying to make things up with his brother. It's a good thing to want to bless others. Um, it's a good thing to want to be found blessing others because it's better to give than to receive. But in some sense, I still think Jacob is trying to buy peace with his brother. And again, I still think Esau has already found it. The transaction has already been completed. They've already had their reconciliation with God, both of them in some way. And because they've both been reconciled to God, they know that, man, everything we have is from God. It doesn't matter if dad blessed you or dad blessed me or who did what or who did who. We're brothers. At the end of the day, we're brothers. The beginning of the day and the end of the day, we're brothers and we need to stay brothers. And Esau doesn't want anything to come between them anymore, even gifts. He's like, I don't need these gifts. I don't want this to be between us either. Let's go on. Verse 12 says, Then Esau said, Let us take our journey and let us go and I will be before you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak and the flocks and herds which are nursing with me. He's still calling them Lord. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. He's still talking to him as a servant and not as a brother. I will lead on slowly at a pace with the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord and see her. And he shall said, Now let me leave with you some of the people where they're with me. And he said, But what need is there? Let me find some favor on the side of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Succoth, and but built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. And Esau says to him, "Let us take our journey, and I'll go before you." Like brother, we're united. Come, you know, you're coming back from Laban's. You don't have a place to live. Come, come with me. Come back to where I live in Seir. But Esau doesn't know God's plan. Esau doesn't know that God has called Jacob to go to Bethel. Jacob hasn't shared it with him. Jacob's still calling him Lord. Uh, you know, Esau wants to bring him back home with him, perhaps even thinking we can live together like brothers again. You know, Psalm 133, 1 through 3 says, A song uh, of ascents. It's the whole psalm. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. That when brothers are together, it's life forevermore. Isn't it fun to be with those you would consider brothers and family and friends? And it's like life. You don't have to have much. You're hanging out eating hot dogs on a paper plate, but you're barbecuing and having fun, fun with your family. But I think that Jacob still seems afraid that Esau is leading him back to be his servant. His captive. That yeah, he's being nice to me here, but when he brings me back, I might have been able to get away from Laban, but there's no way I'm getting away from Esau and his 400 men. But also, Jacob knows it's not where he's supposed to go. He doesn't say, Esau, you know, God's called me to go to Bethel. Why don't you come to Bethel with me? Why don't we see what God will do with us there? We're brothers. We have the same dad. We're the promised nation, promised land, right? Come with me. But he doesn't tell the truth. He doesn't lie to his brother. I mean, he lies to him and says, I'm going to go to Seir with you. And we see that he doesn't go to Seir. He goes to Succoth. He's not honest with his brother about the call of God in his life. No, brother, I'll just, just go ahead. <laughs> you know, uh, the baby is young and the animals, well, they, they've been going a long way. You guys can move much faster than us and it would just be too hard for us to keep up. You know, you've got a really fast car and we've got this old RV. We'll never keep up. We'll catch up with you later. You know, just go ahead. And Jacob has this long excuse, this long answer. And Proverbs 10, 19 says, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who strains his lips is wise. You know, he has this long answer. He doesn't want to go with him. It's obvious. He doesn't just tell him the truth. He doesn't tell him the call of God. He doesn't tell him that he's afraid of him. He just gives him this long excuse to get out of it. 
Isn't that true in life when someone asks us to do something we don't want to do? Sometimes we don't want to say no. We're like, well, uh, you know, you come up with this huge convoluted answer. Like, just say no or just say yes. It's Matthew 5, 37. Jesus says, let your yes be yes or your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. And that ties into trust. We can't just say yes or no to someone. It's kind of hard to trust them. And when they give us long, flowing answers, we can never really tell where their heart lies in the matter. So I uh, can't really trust them. He never just is straight with me. So I like people who are straight with me. Just tell me like it is. You don't, I'm not going to feel one way or the other. I mean, I might, but I'd rather you give me the straight answer before I do something than try and give me a long answer. If you don't want to hang out, fine. All right. You know, maybe I smell and I need a shower and I'll go do that. But Esau here tries to leave some of his men behind. And again, this can be misconstrued. On one hand, it's like probably just a gesture of, hey, you know, you on all this way, you don't have too many guys with you. You've got all these animals and servants. Let me send my guys. Let me protect you as you come through this mountain, as you follow, as you follow me down here. Let me give you some blessing. You know, you give me all these other animals. Let me, you know, let me at least pay you back with some men to help you. I think Jacob also seeing it through the eyes of fear and distrust, he goes, no, I don't want your guys. Uh, what are you sending a police force with me? Or are they really just my captors in disguise? I think also in the new nature of their reconciliation not happening the way he expected. Jacob had, in his mind, I'm sure he had the whole thing planned out what was going to happen. And they're going to get away. And it's not going the way he plans. And I don't think he knows how to respond. And so he falls back in his old nature. And I think rightfully so. Maybe he finds it a little threatening. Maybe Esau doesn't have... Um, the cooth or the wherewithal to say, okay, I get it. You know, we just made up, you know, it's all right. My guys don't need to stay with you. I can see how you could take that. Maybe he's not the best at reading his brother, but I think in some sense Esau's just innocently like, just being with his brother again. What you would do for anyone else? Let me send some guys with you. So where do they go? Well, uh, Esau goes back to Seir, and that's south and east of the Dead Sea. And Jacob goes west towards the Jordan, um, not too far from where they are right now. Uh, and he sets up uh, Succoth. But I tried to print out a map. I don't know if you can see it, but this is, you know, this is like the whole of modern day Israel. Um, I don't have a scale, but it's far. So they're here, and Esau wants to go back down here to Edom, to uh, Seir, but Jacob goes over here. He's supposed to be up over here in Bethel. So Esau heads back this way, and Jacob just says, Oh, yeah, I'll follow you. I'll catch up with you later. And he goes over here. He sneaks away. And again, I think that this is a missed opportunity here. The reconciliation, not on Esau's part, but on Jacob's part, stops a little short. Yeah, there's closure in some sense, but just because there's closure in this issue doesn't mean that it has to be over. But unfortunately for these guys, it's over. They don't, they don't go on together. Yeah, he wasn't supposed to go to see her, but man, again, couldn't there have been such an opportunity of the Lord to use these brothers together? I don't know. I'm not sure. But certainly, you know, if they started acting like brothers again, maybe they would have gone together. I would hope that I could go together with my brother in things, that if something like this had happened to my brother and I, and we can come together, I'd say, brother, come with me. You know, if one day my brother, you know, wants to come and be a part of something that we're doing, I would love for him to be here. I would love for all my friends and family to move here if God would so lead them to do so. But if he doesn't, he doesn't. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to want them to come with me. I think it would be disingenuous for me to say, you know, friends, friends joke sometimes about me coming back to New York, and it'd be disingenuous for me to say, oh, well, you know, we got other, this stuff going on and that. No, well, we know God has called us here, but I think it's also disingenuous for me to stop short of that and to not invite them. You know, I even encouraged a friend the other day, I'm like, hey, you should pray about coming out here. And he was like, what? I'm like, at the end of your life, are you going to regret not just stepping out. You don't have, you know, you're serving and doing other things, but you don't have anything else tying you down. I mean, it's what we see in the New Testament, right? When one goes out, others go with them. I'm not saying that everyone has to come or should come or it's even God's will that they come, but for me as a brother or as a son or as a friend to not say, hey, come with me, I think is shows that maybe I don't want them with me. But I want them all with me. And I think, unfortunately, Jacob didn't want Esau with him as much as Esau wanted to be back with Jacob. Verse 18 it says, Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, which he came from, Padam Aran, and he pitched his tent before the city. And he brought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected an altar there and called it El Elohe Israel. 
It says that Jacob came safely to Shechem. I think the author, author is trying to reinforce that despite everything that happened, Jacob made it back safely. Despite Laban chasing him, despite going through the mountains with all his family, despite crossing all these rivers, despite his brother coming out who used to be murderous, he's safely there. Not that it was an easy journey, but he's safely there. And I think maybe Jacob was a little worried as he went from Penuel to Succoth. Is Esau going to turn around in a day and realize I'm not following him and come after me like Laban did? No, Esau didn't do that. Esau didn't show up. He didn't show up the next day or the next day or the next day. Or if we look at scripture, perhaps ever. This could be the last time that they talked. Thankfully, they made amends. They forgave each other. But man, again, I just, I'm just so heartbroken in a sense as I read this of like what more could have happened with these brothers, with these two, if they just stayed together. But God had brought him safely back. He was on the way to where God had, had promised to him years before. He had all the wealth and all the things to begin this nation. And in this new land, he buys some land from the locals. It reminds me of Abraham buying the burial plot for Sarah. Uh, but again, you know, he's getting a piece of the promised land and, and he's going to buy it one acre at a time, so to speak. You know, God doesn't give him the whole land of Israel right now, but he begins to get a foothold in the area. And it seems that Jacob has some friends here. And El Elohei Israel means the mighty God of Israel. That Jacob, I believe, now knew for sure that God was there not only to bless him with, with wives and children and flocks and possessions, but also to be his protector. That also when God calls him to go somewhere, that God is going to be the one to provide for him. That God is going to provide perfection, protection with him when he can't protect himself. That God is going to provide for him reconciliation with people who want to hurt him. And God does a magic, uh, magic and wonderful work in their lives that nothing else could have done. All those gifts would have appeased the brother intent on murder. I don't want a sheep. I want him dead. Laban wanted everything back, but what appeased him? Well, he knew that God showed up to him in a dream and that he was going to be in trouble if he didn't. And Jacob had been brought through a lot to get to this point. You know, I think about all the hard things that happen in life and all the things that don't go as expected. And you look in the scripture and you go, well, that seems to be God's M.O., how often do you see things going good to get people to where God wants them to be? Yeah, things go well at certain times in Joseph's life and in other people's lives. But a lot of times things go really wrong in order for God to get them to where they need to go. And uh, as we close here, second closing, because there's a third one. David Guzik says, and he pitched his tent before the city, and he says, it is good Jacob came to the promised land, and he settled there, but it came short of full obedience. Because it seems God directed him to return to Bethel, Genesis 31, 13. He says, uh, then he erected an altar there and called it El Elohe Israel. The altar was good, but complete obedience was better. God wants obedience first, then sacrifice. Jacob and his family will suffer in this wasted disobedience period of time. I mean, if he had just gone a little bit further, if he had just been a little more honest with his brother, a little more trusting in God, he wouldn't have suffered some more. I think sometimes that in our life, like God calls us out to do something and we go for it and we go near it and we follow it, but we stop short and we wonder why that extra blessing isn't there as well because we've stopped short and we need to go the whole way. We can't make up for that gap in the relationship with God by sending out a few camels, a few animals, a few servants. Like Jacob's trying to make up that gap with his Lord Esau, his older brother, who he still looks up to. In the same way with God, when God wants that reconciliation with us, we can't make up that gap. There's no work to make up for. It's not Jesus and something. It's not Jesus and my works, Jesus and how much I've done for him. It's just Jesus. And when we have that, then we can get to the promised land within Bethel, the house of God. But for Jacob and Esau, this was the beginning and sadly, apparently also the end of their reconciliation, like I said, because we don't hear anything else about Esau. A couple chapters later in 36, we see there's the, the genealogy of him. But this is it. We see his people, the Edomites later on. But again, I still find it very tragic that these twin brothers were separated for their life. Even though they lived in the same tent growing up, they were separated by fighting and by trying to win each other over and by the, the favoritism of their parents. They were separated by the physical separation for how many decades? apart and even after they're reconciled they go their separate ways again i don't know they had to i think maybe esau could, could have done something different i don't know i'm not god but i just 
knowing the love for family and the ideals that God has for us, man, I would just love for a family to be back together completely. I would love it if my family and everyone I knew was following the Lord completely. And some of them are. Some aren't. I would love to see us all serving God completely like they do in Acts and they could write something about us one day. Not that that's what I want, but for the sake of argument, to look back and say, see what God did in that family. See how they all used to care about their possessions, their careers, their paths and lives. And God said to them, no, go do this. And begins to call them out and, and, and together and follow each other and be a family of God together. I truly want to be a family that, you know, choose this day whether you serve God or not. As for me and my household, we will serve God. Whether no one follows or not. I don't want people to follow me. I want people to follow God. And if my family is following God and they're in Milwaukee or China or New York, that's fine. But if they're not following God and they should be somewhere else, I want them there. I would love for them to be with me in a selfish matter. But if God has something better for them, that's what I want. That's why I try and encourage all my friends and family to seek God and what He has for them because... At the end of the day, I don't want them with me. God wants them somewhere else. I want them in the best place of blessing, the Bethel for them. And I wonder, perhaps it's the Lord speaking to us, who have we been separated from? Have we been brought far away from some place in life, some calling God has for us? And is God calling you to go back? Is God calling you to remain? Is he calling you to go somewhere new? Whether that's somewhere new geographically or somewhere new spiritually. Perhaps both. Perhaps neither. I think it's always somewhere new spiritually, even if our geography doesn't change. But is he calling you to be reconciled with someone? Is there someone that needs your forgiveness? Is there someone that you need forgiveness from? Jesus says in Matthew 23, 24, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar... And there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. It may be right where you are. It may not be. But truly the promises of God can only be fulfilled if you're in the right place with him. And you can't make that difference up by sacrificing And so God says, go, be reconciled, and return to the promised land that I have for you. And that promised land could be the same place, but now that you're reconciled, there's a peace there. There's a a flowing there. There's a land of milk and honey where there used to be strife. Sometimes we can't get further in life because we haven't gone back. doesn't mean that we need to go back. But like when we were in Maryland, we were praying about the next step. We knew long term it was here. We knew that God was calling us out here and this was the purpose for us. But we knew we had to go back to New York for a season. We didn't know how long, we didn't know what for, but we knew we had to go back there in order to go forward. So if there's some place, God, that we need to go back to, God, and I think for all of us it should start with the cross that when we go back and we consider the powerful work that you did there, that God, like we were praying about and worshiping about on Wednesday, just that, Man, when we see you for all you've done there, how can we go anywhere else and do anything else and want anything else other than what you have for us? Forgive us where we put other things in front of you or we put our earthly relationships, even good ones like brothers and family, ahead of your desire for our lives. And let us, God, come to you. And God, maybe we be reconciled to you. And God, from there, would you bring us back into good places with those around us? Would we make up the friendships that we need to make up? Would we ask for forgiveness from the people that we've hurt? And God, would you uh, bring us to the right place? Help us not stop short. And Lord, help us bring everyone with us, whether it's in life, to uh, a mission field, or more importantly, God, home to you in heaven, that the people around us we know and love would be reconciled to you. And God, we would be ministers of that reconciliation. Lord, we love you and we pray all this by your spirit. In Jesus' name. Fill us, we pray. Enable us, we pray. Help us trust you when things get hard. In Jesus' name, amen.